real quick, um, I just I wanted to just do this experiment because I've done this for three three or four years. This is my third Easter Sunday with you guys. He is risen. Okay, both both responses are great. Um, that's the woohoo and the he is risen indeed. So I just wanted to try that again and see see where we were. So whenever I say it again. Um, you can do a woohoo, or you can say, He is risen indeed. He is risen. Yeah, it's easier to go woohoo, isn't it? Um, it's, we've been embarking last month on uh, a thing called Nourish Group. It's kind of these uh, host homes in which that we, we go to. Um, back there on, uh, in the lobby, there is a a little shelving area that says let us pray underneath there are some um, neon green cards Um, this is what I want you to do if you are interested in being placed in one of our host homes on Sunday evenings not the first Sunday of every uh, every month but on the first Sunday of most months we meet here and we do the reaping we draw the names of the people who you're going to going to be uh, the homes in which that you're going to Um, one or two things. If you would l- have not been in a nourish group and you would like to be in a nourish group, you would just take one of those neon green cards and you would fill those out. Okay? And here's the sad part about this, okay? If you have been in a nourish group, those of you that are in a nourish group right now, if you have been in a nourish group and you do not want to be in a nourish group, you fill out one of those cards and you just write appropriately. Thanks. But no thanks, okay? I, just, just for um, my information purposes, okay? Uh, we, made a, we made a video, Tony. Uh, we made a video kind of in lieu of this Easter season, kind of advertising our nourish groups. And so I hope that you enjoy it whenever you see it. Number two. Whenever you see it, I hope that you enjoy it. He's the only rabbit known to be able to lay an egg. His favorite sport is hopscotch. He's never met a stranger, therefore he will call you Doc. His favorite actor is Rabbit Downey Jr. His favorite song is Every Bunny Was Kung Fu Fighting. I'm in a nourish group. Stay nourished, my friends. <laughs> so it's my hope that you guys sign up for nourish groups. If you're part of our church, um, one of the things is is that uh, we would uh, we would like for you to be a, a part of a deeper conversation that goes on Sunday morning. And so that's what the invitation is for. I I don't know if you guys ever listen to. NPR, National Public Radio, or anything like that. Um, used to, I used to drive, you know, three hours from Tologa to uh, Tulsa and, and back the round trip whenever I went to school at Oral Roberts University. And so I always find things to listen to because, you know, stations kind of change. You just cannot have the same station the entire time. Well, I used to listen to NPR because that's the only thing that would come in uh, on the, the, the turnpike between Tulsa and Stillwater. So there was a story that I remember about this lady that, that talked about how that she liked to, she liked to leave her, her keys in her ignition. Uh, everywhere that she went, she'd just leave her keys in her ignition. And she would tell her husband, she said, listen, this is the best place in which that I know that I'm never going to lose my keys, okay? I'm always going to find them there. She said one day she had a meeting in, in a hotel somewhere. And uh, after her meeting, she came back out into the parking lot and she started looking around in the parking lot. 
And she had to swallow, and she had to really figure out, you know, what happened to her car. And I think that she just came to this conclusion was that, you know, I've been leaving my keys in the ignition. I'm just going to have to call the police because I believe that my car has been stolen. So she calls the police officers and, and, and police station. She tells them, my, my, my vehicle has been stolen, and uh, this is how I know. It's, I, I know this is silly, but I leave the keys in the ignition whenever I, I park the vehicle. So uh, police officers take the report and stuff like that. And so her and her husband always have this argument and say, honey, if you leave your keys in the vehicle, your vehicle is going to get stolen. And so she just had this overwhelming sense of guilt and shame because she had to take the, the shame call. She called her husband. She says, honey, I have something to tell you. And before you say anything at all, listen. Uh, I know that you've told me not to leave the ignitions in, uh, the key in the ignition, but I tell you what, my car has been stolen. I'm here at the hotel in the parking lot, and I just do not know what to do. My car is gone. And there was this long pause on the other line. So silent that she even thought in the back of her mind that the, car, that the call had been dropped. <laughs> and she goes, honey? And, and the husband responds, are you kidding me? I dropped you off at that meeting today. <laughs> and she responds, well, come pick me up. And he says, I will, as soon as I can convince this nice officer that I didn't steal your vehicle. It reminds me of a time again coming back from Tulsa. My wife and I were, were married, and some of you have heard this story. We were, we were run, running low on gas, and we had to pull into this, this gas station. It was a QT. QTs are really cool in eastern Oklahoma because you can get a Slurpee. You can get whatever. They're really, really convenient. Hey, that's why they call them convenience stores, right? Anyway, um, I really had to use the bathroom. We pulled in. I started the gas pump, and I said, honey, I'll be back uh, just you know, you got this right? Lock the doors. She said, okay. So I run in the, the restroom and I come out in the, in the same vicinity in which the, the, I had parked the vehicle. There was another vehicle. At the time we were driving a white um, Ford Fusion and there was a white vehicle over there and I looked out the QT and there was a strange man that was walking around the car to the passenger side and the passenger side he knocks on the window and all of a sudden this holy anger comes over me this protective measure comes over me as I'm walking out the door I say hey what are you doing and he, he stands up and he looks at me and he notices we make eye contact. He notices that I'm talking to him. He's like, what? Like that. And, I, and then all of a sudden, I start, I mean, thinking super fast. I'm looking around and I see that the vehicle that he is standing next to is not mine. <laughs> My wife had pulled the car up front conveniently so I can just hop right in as soon as I get out. I didn't look to my left and there it is. And so this guy is ready to pick a fight with me. And so I'm like, hey, I go, hey! And he goes, what? And I was like, nothing. <laughs> Got into the vehicle and ran off, basically. Oh, I didn't want no piece of that. <laughs> Sometimes we do crazy things, and sometimes we, we mess stuff up. <laughs> we do. We mess stuff up. We make mistakes. Sometimes we don't know what we're thinking at some points in time. You know, if we've been up all night with a child that just won't sleep all the way through the night. <sighs> Last night, pray for us, guys. <laughs> sometimes we blow it. Sometimes we blow life. Sometimes it's much more severe than just, you know, losing track of a car or leaving the keys in the ignition to where that somebody just runs off with your car. Sometimes in life, we just blow it. We blow it. And sometimes we mess up so bad that we're mad at ourselves. You know, today what I want to talk about is not messing stuff up just like that. What I want to talk about today is a is a certain type of failure. What happens whenever we have failed and offended the heart of God? What about the times in our lives whenever we say to ourselves, not only have I hurt myself, 
not only have I hurt my, my spouse, my children, I may have even hurt my future, the people that love me, but I've also offended the heart of God. I'm going to be very short, okay, today. Very, very short. You can say amen to that <laughs> if you'd like. I won't be offended. You might offend the heart of God, but not me, okay? Uh, so I, I say this at VBS whenever there is a very important thing that, that if you don't get anything out of the sermon, I want you to get this. So lean in, everybody. I don't, I, you can if you'd like. It'd be nice. I kind of envisioned this whenever I said, lean in, everybody going. <laughs> It didn't land like that. <laughs> but what I would like to do is that I'd like to just say this one thing, and it's my hope that you could leave from this place, and if this is the only thing that you hear, you can, you can go and you can tell people, say, how was church today? Was Easter service rocking? Uh, you could say, yeah, or, or yeah, it was okay, you know. Uh, somebody say, well, what did the preacher say? You can tell them this, this very, very thing, okay? This is it. Everybody... Everybody has failed God. In some point in our lives, everybody has failed God. The Bible talks about it like this in, in, in Romans. It says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have. At some point in time in our lives, all have fallen short. But this is the good news. I'll give you... The synopsis, here is the good news. Everybody, everybody can be forgiven. What I'd like for you to do is I'd like to, for you to turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Sue Smith was telling me this morning, and you're going to love her after this, I told her, I said, this is probably one of the shortest sermons that I'm going to preach. She says, you know what I heard on the radio today is that you don't even have to preach at all on Easter. <laughs> she says, it's the message in itself, you know. I was like, well, I don't think I can get away with that. But Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And if you have that found, would you stand in honoring the reading of God's word this morning? I know you've been up and down a lot today, and, and I'll wait on you uh, till you find it, but uh, this is God's holy and precious word. I had a mentor in the gospel that would do this every single time, and uh, I think it's special whenever we read God's word together. Mark chapter 16, it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who's going to roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But whenever they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Wouldn't you be? Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus of Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. The place where you laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And we know that that's not true because every other gospel says that they told everyone, everyone. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your word. Pray that, uh, that your word doesn't return void today, that it lands upon our heart and that we are totally convinced totally dedicated to you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So what, uh, what we do here is whenever we see this passage of scripture, whenever it says they were bewildered and afraid and they didn't tell anybody, it was at that particular moment in time whenever these ladies just like, I'm so scared, I'm not going to tell anybody. And it's not like that I'm saying that, that scripture is not true, but what that was what was happening with those ladies at that particular moment. 
And we, and we know that the story continues and, and their fear gets eradicated because Jesus begins to appear to them and begin this resurrected Christ is appearing to these women and, and they become filled with faith and less with fear. So I've got a lot of people, you know, we've got a lot of people in our congregation with kids. Isn't that, isn't that good? To, to be in a congregation with young children, and, and it's good for my family. I tell you what, we've, we've loved, the, we're, we've been here for almost four years. We've loved growing in faith. We love raising our children in Watonga and in this community because we get to raise our chi- children alongside children their own age. They've actually got friends whenever they come to church, and that is so, such a blessing. It's a blessing to us that we, we get to have faith with, with people of, you know, more years than us <laughs> and also less years of us and some with children that are the same age of our kids but I tell you what, what what ends up happening whenever you've got a congregation full of children and I'm not bashing this at all I'm really kind of bragging about this but what ends up happening is you've got parents that have children that the parents think that they their children are exceptional and above average about everything else, right, Tony? Yeah, um, I think that about my own children. You know, um, my child is better than yours. You know, type of thing. Not really, but they, we just believe that they've got a bigger learning curve. That you know, that they, um, you know, what I'm talking about. We've got people like that. That even you've got grandchildren. You know, you people with grandchildren. You believe that your grandchildren hung the moon, and there was none like them. And it's true. It is absolutely true. Continue to think that way. Continue to love your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids. Right, Arthena? But I was thinking about, you know, what to present today and, and thinking about just how everybody has started life. And we find ourselves today and, and we believe that there is so much information that as a child needs to know growing up. And it's just this overwhelming responsibility. And I found this video. Anybody's ever seen the, the Kid President videos? Uh, very, very cool. I found this video that I think is very appropriate today. And it's from Kid President. A, a letter written to a kid that was on his first day after he's born. And here is some advice that he has to give. Hope you enjoy it. There's, there's a lot that the kids need to know. A letter to a person on their first day here. Today over 360,000 babies will be born and you are one of them. Welcome, this is the world. It's a pretty cool place. There's lots to see, smell, there's corn dogs. Ah, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's just so much to do. Singing, Dancing? Oh, and laughing. <laughs> Laughing's the best. It's especially great when when you laugh, milk comes out of your nose. But only if you just have milk. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just gross. Some days, gross things will happen. Some days, awesome things will happen. Some days, you'll get ice cream. And some days, you won't. Some days, your kite will fly high. Some days, it gets stuck in the tree. It's just how it is here. There's plenty of reasons to dance. You just gotta look for them. Don't worry though, you won't be doing this alone. You're gonna meet lots of people here. Some of them will be really nice and some won't be. It's not that they can't be, it's just, maybe they're just having a bad day. Being a person is hard sometimes. You should give people high fives just for getting out of bed. Oh, high fives, I forgot to explain that. How do I explain this? Um, it's kind of, high fives are like hitting someone who is your friend. Uh, that's really good. <laughs> Just treat everybody like it's their birthday. Even if they don't deserve it. Because we all mess up sometimes. The biggest mess up, not forgiving each other's mess ups. Maybe you'll be a teacher. Maybe you'll be president. Maybe you'll cure every disease ever. You might even see the Grand Canyon, swim in the ocean. Oh, this is so, so much. Uh, it's a lot. Oh, try this. Take a breath. Isn't that amazing? It's called breathing. You're going to do it a lot, but nobody knows exactly how much. So enjoy it. Pay attention. Take brain pictures. Because amazing things will happen every day. You're going to 
do so much. But it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. And you, you're awesome. You're made that way. You're made from love, to be love, to spread love. And love is always louder, no matter what. Even if hate has a bullhorn, love is louder. So let your life be loud. Let's shout to the world. Things can be better. It's okay about all the mess ups. Going back to I'm sorry, I'm just keep bringing that up. I don't think I told you this yet. We're really glad you're here. We don't say that enough to each other here. Because, well, life gets busy. You're gonna be important and you're gonna do a lot. And you're gonna smell great, but don't get too busy. Remember to let everybody know you're glad they're here. You don't have to remember all this right now. But you're gonna need a pep talk sometimes, and that's okay. For now, remember this. You're awake, you're awesome. Live like it. Wasn't that good? Uh, I enjoyed that. You might go to the next slide. Um, there was a time whenever all of us were born. Can you remember that? Can you remember when somebody special in your life was born? And uh, so there's many of you that have lived a long time, haven't you? I feel like that I've lived a long time. You know, I'm just 31, about to thir turn 32. Uh, and I'll get to that here in a, in a minute. But as a young pastor, um, and, and I say that I'm young, I haven't met a lot of pastors that are my age, but um, I've already had many conversations with people that would come up to me and say, Pastor Kaysen, I've blown it. I've completely blown it. I've messed up my life. Well, what have you, what, what happened? And they, they would say, I don't know what happened. It just, it just happened. Way many times I've fallen short in my life. Way too many times I've blown it. I've said this many times before, and I've asked this question before in sermons before, and I, but I think that it's important because it puts clarity on, on, on why that we meet here, and it, puts, it just kind of clears the mud a little bit. Here's, here's the question, okay? The question is, what is your greatest regret? For some of you, if you're having trouble thinking about what it is, you probably don't have one. You probably don't have a great regret. But whenever I ask the question to some of you, you automatically thought about what that regret was. And sometimes it haunts you, and sometimes it, it is right there in, in front of you. It's a regret that towers over all other regrets, and it dwarfs all other regrets. It's failures of all failures. And you want to know what today is about? It isn't about failures. It isn't about mistakes. It's about hope. It's about the hope that we all have. It's about life. It's about resurrection. It's about dying and living again. That's great news. Any of you ever seen the show, uh, I think that it's on ABC, called Resurrection? How many here? Anybody? A few of you? Okay. It's, it's about this town, a little town in Missouri that uh, people start raising from the dead that, that have, have passed away either tragically or, or life's kind of cut them shot, short. And it's kind of just flipping this town upside down. And I think that we're intrigued with this idea of resurrection. We love this idea of resurrection. Um, but probably just like this little town in Missouri and just like everybody else in the New Testament, they didn't really believe that it would actually happen. And I, I think that if we were completely honest with each other today, that I don't, be, I don't think that many of us really believe that resurrection really happens. We've seen it happen in Jesus. Yes, we're gathered here today and we believe that it happens in Jesus, but does it happen to us? In this lifetime, does it ever happen to us? Whenever Jesus talked about death, whenever he talked about his own death, he always, always talked about him being raised to life. And this is how he would normally say it. He says, I will be rejected, I will be crucified, but on the third day I will be raised to life. But whenever it happened, whenever it actually really happened, do you want to know people's response? <gasps> they were shocked. They couldn't believe it had happened, but Jesus would have been saying it all along. 
In the 1970s uh, is whenever Christian television re really began to get its wings. And there was this guy by the name of Jim Baker. Jim Baker was a really good promoter of Christian television. He kind of got on this bandwagon. And he started uh, at promoting Christian television and was really, really successful. And he had this gospel that he would preach. And the, and the gospel was prosperity gospel. He believed that if you were a follower of Jesus Christ, God wants everyone to be rich. And to be honest with you, it is a gospel that I really can't find in Scripture. But nonetheless, that he, 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 uh, he got really wealthy himself. He, he lived the lush life. He drove Rolls Royces. He had uh, many uh, big houses and stuff like that. He, he started selling property to, to, he started selling property, a property he didn't own himself, to people who probably really couldn't afford it. And later on, what ended up happening, he got into this sex scandal, scandal and he found himself in prison. Jim Baker. Uh, highly, highly visible Christian. And it wasn't just a few years ago that I, I don't really remember where I, I read this or, or saw an article. I think that it was in a Christian magazine um, where one of the articles was written by Jim Baker. And I was surprised that Jim Baker was actually reading or writing an article in a Christian magazine. So I had to read it. And he tells a, a personal story about himself. He says, whenever I was in incarcerated, whenever I was in jail, my duty as, as a prisoner was to clean the toilets, clean the com commodes. He said I'd put on my, my, uh, my jumpsuit and I'd put on my gloves and stuff like that. And my just, my, if you know Jim Baker, he cared about this. My hair would get all a mess. And uh, he remembers one time whenever he was cleaning this commode and a prison guard walks into the, the prison, uh, the, the cell in which he was cleaning this toilet. And he says, hey Jim, there's somebody here to see you. And Jim really, if he was, he was being honest, he says, I really didn't want to see anybody, and I definitely didn't want anybody to see me in this state. He said, so I, what I did is that I, I got up off of my knees, and I turned around, and as the electronic doors came open, lo and behold, what I see behind those doors is the most notable, most trustworthy evangelist in America, Dr. Billy Graham stand behind those doors and as those doors open he just kind of reached his arms out like this and Jim being ashamed of, of the state in which he was he, he kind of slowly just walked towards him and put his head on his chest and Dr. Billy Graham began to hug him and embrace him and what Jim ends up saying he says uh, he stayed a while he began to talk to me he prayed with me, and uh, before he left, he looked at Jim, and he said, Jim, I sure love you, and he left that place. You want to talk about failures? I hope this doesn't land judgmental, but I mean, I, I guarantee you, one of the biggest failures to God that was visible was Jim Baker. I mean, he failed. He messed up big time. He had blown it, had completely blown it. But grace and mercy and love came walking into a prison guard, prison cell, stepped right up to Jim Baker and put his arms around him and says that I love you. The angel comes to Mary Magdalene and, and the rest of the ladies that were there. And he says, go tell the disciples and Peter what you've seen here. Now, if you're like me, you're going through the list. And the list, Peter's on that list of disciples. Why in the world is the angel saying, go tell Peter, the disciples, and Peter? What's up with that? It intrigues me a little bit. Peter, talk about another guy that has failed the heart of God. Before Jesus was led away to be crucified, he says... Peter, you will deny me. Before the sun raises, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And, and Peter just kind of bows up, you know. He straightens up his back, 
puts out his chest and he says, I will die with you before I deny you. Jesus begins to, to be led away to be crucified and, and Peter kind of, he follows closely behind and people will start talking. Hey, weren't you one of the guys that were with him? Yeah, I can tell by your accent. You're from Galilee. No, he says, absolutely not. And he ends up, they keep on confronting him and he says, absolutely not. He curses them. He says, I, be I have nothing associated with this man at all. And he denies him three times. And the rooster crows. You can imagine the f amount of failure that is on the weight of shoulders of Peter. Jesus is crucified and they bury him in a tomb. And I, I can imagine that if you found Peter the very next day, I can imagine him finding him somewhere looking like this. Just with his hands and his, his head in his hands. And he was just, I just imagine that he just felt completely failed. That he's completely failed the heart of God. And I believe that he felt like that there was no redeeming of this, that situation at all. He's blown it. You know what he does? He goes back to what he finds is familiar. He goes back to where Jesus had called him in the very beginning. He goes back and fishes. We know that Peter wasn't a very good fisherman to begin with. And we find him after Jesus' resurrect, after his resurrection, that Peter, nothing really has changed. They've been fishing all night. And he hadn't caught anything. And somebody calls out, Jesus calls out from the shore, Hey guys, caught any fish? He said, No, we've been fishing all night and hadn't caught a thing. And Jesus says, Well, cast your nets on the other side. And so they cast their nets on the other side and they catch uh, so many fish. Not even, they couldn't even put it into the boats. And so they recognize him. They say, It's Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter does something that is kind of odd to us. He puts his clothes on and then he jumps into the water and goes to shore. And there's Jesus next to a fire, cooking breakfast. He's cooking toast. He's cook, cooking fish. And he gathers Peter in. He says, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, well, feed my sheep. Peter, do you, do you love me? Lord, you know of all things that I love you. Well, feed my lambs, Jesus says. The third time, Scripture says, the third time, intentionally Jesus asked Peter for a third time. Peter, do you love me? And it just broke Peter's heart again. Lord, you know. You know that I love you. Well, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And Jesus because he's Jesus, isn't focused upon Peter's failure. He's focused on what Peter is going through. And the angel in our text today tells the ladies, go tell the disciples and go tell Peter because I know what he's going through. I know what he, how his heart breaks. Go tell him this good news that I will meet him in Galilee. Um... Uh, there was a man that, that wrote kind of this, this book about, uh, he kind of had figured the average age of a man was to live 70, 78 years. And so what he did is that he figured out uh, in his lifetime, if he was to live 78 years, that he, uh, he would figure out how many weeks that he had left. And he would get this large jar, and he went and bought that many marbles, and he'd fill up his, his, his jar full of marbles. And, and based upon how many weeks that he had left to live. And every Sunday he would wake up and he would take a marble and he would throw it away. And you can imagine that, that more weeks that would go by that, that jar would start to slowly, slowly get empty. Now, I'm not much of a fan of marbles. I am a fan of M&M's. <laughs> And uh, I, I tried my best whenever I was at Dollar General yesterday to try to figure out how many M&Ms are in this, you know, 12.60 ounce bag, okay? If you ever need that equation, I've got it for you, okay? And so this is, this is my life. This is how many weeks that I've got left, okay? 
not, not completely accurate because I did eat some this morning while I was bringing it up here, so I just couldn't help myself. Um, and so here it is Sunday, you know. Um, you, don't, you don't just throw away M&Ms, do you? No, you, you've got to eat them, okay? If you are great-grandchildren of Arthena, would you guys mind coming up here? Would you help me out today? Just real quick. Hurry. If you're not up here in three seconds, you do not get these M&Ms. Okay, just kind of gather around this chair right here. What a good-looking family. Um, you guys going to grandma's after the service? Okay. Um, I tell you what, as a, if you're a woman, you've got uh, the average age lifespan is 82 years, okay? So I did the total, my, my total lifespan since I was born, if I meet the age of, you know, uh, 78, I would have lived uh, 4,058 weeks, okay? So I figured out I've got 1,326 weeks left, okay? Depressing, right? Uh, this is a... <laughs> The sermon's about hope, right? <laughs> I didn't mean to depress you. And some of you said, well, you don't have to worry about that, case, and I can fit all my M&Ms in a medicine bottle, you know, um, <laughs> whatever I've got left. Um, but the guy begins to, begins to uh, write this article, and he said, at the end of his book, he says, today I threw away my last marble. He says, and every week here on out is a bonus. Guys, I would really love to give you this, these M&Ms, but that's all I've got left. This is all the life that I've got left. You get what I'm saying? No, you don't get it? Did that not land well? No? Okay. Well, here it is, guys. Would you like to have these M&Ms? Okay. Well, i tell you what you're going to do, okay? I know that there's not a lid on this. And so what I'd like for you to do, who's the most responsible one of you? Okay. <laughs> I like that honesty right there. What I want you to do is I want you to take that to one of the, the parents and don't spill that, but share that after that you eat your lunch today, okay? Give them a round of applause. You guys can go sit down if you like. They're like, is anybody going to take my picture? You know, I'm up on stage. <laughs> so uh, let me just say this. There's a reason. There's a reason behind that. And the reason why is that I have to ask is, uh, with Kid President and, and, and all the information that you need to know, the question is, how many M&Ms are left in your jar? How many M&Ms are left? And you can't just settle by saying, I failed in this life. You cannot just settle by saying, I failed, I've blown it in my life. And that's just the way that it is, and that's just the way that it's going to be. And just be satisfied with that, right? You just can't do that. Whatever time that you've got left, however many M&Ms that you've got left in your jar, you've got to find life. So how do you land the sermon? <laughs> Some of you were thinking about five minutes ago you should have landed it. Um, but uh, the, that's what I'm asking you, you know. Do I end it by saying this? I've blown it. That's me. Well, come to Jesus. I've messed my life up so bad. Come to Jesus. Would you like that? Big problem with that. Big problem with that. Because Peter, Peter didn't come to Jesus. Jesus came to Peter. <laughs> I, I really like that, guys. In the midst of our failures, and here we are, Easter Sunday 2015, and maybe it's you that just raise your hand and say, yeah, you, you've, you've nailed it. That's me. I've, I've messed up bad. You want to know what the good news on this Easter and this Resurrection Sunday is, is that here He is. Here you are. Jesus is amongst us. And He comes to you and He comes to me in the midst of our failures. You might say, I've blown it. Well, good news. He still comes to us. I've blown it. Robin, would you mind just coming to the piano just for a little bit? I, again, I, what I would like to do 
is just in just a few moments, just give me a couple of minutes. Um, what I really would like to do is just give you the opportunity, you know, to, to pray. Um, I don't have to pray with you if, if, if that's something that you don't like, but uh, you might be saying, you know, I, I've blown it. It's hard for me to go to church. It's hard for me to pray sometimes because of my guilt and my shame. Jesus comes to you today. You might be here on this Easter Resurrection Sunday and you've come with your family. And maybe, hey, this is a great opportunity to say, I just want to spend time in prayer with my family. I'm going to gather my kids. I'm going to gather my grandkids. I'm just going to spend time in prayer because this is meaningful for me. It doesn't mean that, that if you come up to these altars, it doesn't mean that, that, that you've done anything shameful or anything like that. Tell you what, altars are a place of resurrection. Good things happen. So would you come? Robin's going to play. You can spend some time. Jesus comes to us this morning and he comes to you. And I want to give you the opportunity to come. Would you stand with me?